Hi, I'm Dr. Stina McCullough. Thank you for joining me. Today, I wanna to discuss a topic that touches all of us. It's how COVID-19 is affecting our food supply and what each of us can do about it. Now, from a consumer's perspective, the food supply chain has clearly been disrupted, especially if you rely on the industrial food system. For example, I've seen grocery stores that are out of certain food items. I mean, last week, my neighbor couldn't find any meat at our local grocery store. I mean, I never thought I'd see the day when I'd walk into a store and there's no ground beef or no chicken, there's just empty shelves. And some grocery stores are even rationing food, such as you can only buy a certain amount of milk or a certain number of carton of eggs. We're often waiting in line to get into the grocery stores and then only a certain amount of people can go in at a time. And actually, as people are shifting now out of the grocery stores to online purchasing of food, those online sellers are starting to become overwhelmed, which is now causing shipping delays, sometimes up to two weeks or even longer. Some online stores are actually not even accepting new customers right now because they cannot keep up with the demand. For example, I know Imperfect Foods and Misfits Market and even Seasonal Roots, they're all putting new customers on hold or they're delaying their delivery start dates. And even Amazon is having a difficult time keeping up with demand. For over a week, I've tried to place an order for food delivery from Whole Foods and there are no available time slots. So generally speaking, it has become challenging for consumers to actually procure their own food. Now, and I have never experienced anything like this in my lifetime. But what I'm wondering now is what's happening on the other side of the coin? What challenges are the food producers experiencing and are family farms in jeopardy of going out of business? To answer these questions and to provide some much needed hope and to offer some solutions, I've asked Joel Salatin to join us. Now, Joel and his family operate Polyface Farm in Virginia. Beginning in 1961, the family developed soil building and water enhancing protocols to grow pastured livestock, including beef, pork, chicken, turkey, duck, and sheep. The farm direct markets to individual families, restaurants, and institutional dining services. Polyface Farm also holds educational seminars, farm tours, even day camps, and other events to encourage duplication and better understanding. Joel himself has authored 12 books, soon to be 13. He's also the editor of the world's premier pastured livestock publication titled The Stockman Grass Farmer. Joel was also featured in the New York Times best-selling book, Omnivore's Dilemma, as well as the award-winning documentary, Food, Inc. Well, Joel, welcome to the program. Thank you, Sina. It's always a delight and an honor to spend time with you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Well, let's get right to it. What are you seeing happening on the farms? Uh, well, uh, several things. One, one is we lost our restaurants. I mean, that's, that's, the, first, that's the first big negative. Uh, we service, our farm services about 50 restaurants, and literally only about two or three of them are actually still, still really actually running. And those two, of course, have, have really been aggressive about developing a, a curbside takeout program and, you know, aggressive. Most of them have just closed. Um, and so, so that's a big, that's a big hit. It has been more than made up for by a, a, a literally an explosion on the direct market side, on the direct retail side. And so our farm store has never been busier here on the farm. Uh, our, our urban drop points, we service about 30 urban drop points in Northern Virginia, Southern Maryland, Richmond, Williamsburg. Um, and, and those sales are, are literally double what they normally are in March. Um, well, we're in April now, but anyway, in March and, um, and our online sales are up like four or 500%, uh, um, shipping where we, we ship, we, we ship food. So we have an online, you know, uh, sales cart platform, uh, and that's up four or 500%. This is the first year in our existence that we've been short of eggs in the spring. We have never been short of eggs in the spring. We're always, you know, giving away eggs to the, you know, to our, our bank and our small engine repair mechanic, and, you know, uh, um, and, and our chefs, you know, our good, our good restaurants, uh, like, like, you know, little eggs and stuff that are hard to sell. And this year we can't, um, you know, everything is up. So, so interestingly, in the in the melee, um, 
of all this, financially, we're having the best spring we've ever had in our, in our history for us personally, financially. And so, so how can that be? Um, are people suddenly eating more food? What, what's the deal? Well, the deal is that the supermarkets practice just in time inventory. Um, anybody that knows anything about business knows about, you know, as, as, as the computer allowed us to track inventory better, uh, everything went to just in time. That's the industry standard. Well, the problem with just in time is there's nothing behind the curtain. <laughs> you know, when the when the aisles are empty, uh, there, there's there's nothing back there because it's because it's in someplace else, which is which is not very much because they're depending on someplace else. And so as you move back down the the food chain inventory in the retail sector. Uh, see, in, in, the, in the industry, there are, there are two very, very different, um, very different themes. Uh, one is wholesale uh, to, you know, to, to restaurants and institutions, event centers, things like that. And then the other is toward retail. And the problem is that in the industry, it, it's not that we're suddenly eating all this food. It's suddenly that all of that food that was in the queue heading toward restaurants and institutions, suddenly there was no market for it there, but because of just-in-time inventorying, packaging requirements, SKU numberings, barcode type, you know, insurance, uh, insurance and protocols, there's all, there, there's all of this stuff surrounding, you know, when, when, you, when you head down this path, you've got to stay on that path. So that food, that food cannot get diverted. Here's a perfect example just for, for us. So last week, we ran out of ground beef uh, here at the farm. I mean, that's unheard of. We never run out of ground beef. We always stock plenty and have plenty. We ran out of ground beef for our retail customers. But we had 5,000 pounds in five-pound packages for restaurants. Restaurants don't want one pound packages. They want five pound packages. So here we are with customers all coming in wanting one pound packages and, and oh, well, they're, they're out of ground beef. No, we've got 5,000 pounds, but they don't want a five pound package of ground beef. And so th th this is simply an example of, of, of uh, imagine that you know, exponentially larger in the greater food system where you can't just say, oh, well, we're short of, of beef over at Kroger's, so let's divert, let's divert the steamship round and all the stuff headed to, you know, uh, restaurants. Let's divert that over to Kroger. Well, you can't uh, because it's a whole different, it's a whole different, whatever, chain of custody. It's a, it's a different thing. And so the, the interesting thing is, as I've talked to farmers, you know, like us all over the country, what's interesting is that in this, in this uh, hiccup, um, that's, I guess, the nicest way to say it. Uh, uh, travesty maybe would be bigger, but but in in this in this big um, shock in the system, those of us who are direct marketing farmers, we don't do just in time inventory because we're we're working with seasonal fluctuations and and we're, we're out here with a stockpile. So around the country, farmers like us we have actually been the ones who stepped in to, to fill the slack of the uh, sophisticated techno glitzy supermarket that was actually much less, um, uh, it was much more rigid. It's a much more rigid system than, than us. And so we had all this stockpile. Now we pulled down our stockpile for sure, but we're actually much more uh, nimble nimble to to respond to the to the change of trajectory than than the bigger industrial systems uh, it's easier to turn a speedboat than an aircraft carrier yeah and i definitely think that's one thing that we're seeing too as consumers is that i think a lot of us live in this bubble that there's always food because we live in abundance right most sure. of us particularly my generation has never right. had to deal with you know Absolutely. food scarcity I mean, food's everywhere, you know, grocery right. stores, fast food restaurants, con right. you know, convenience shops everywhere. 
gas so, station. <laughs> yes, exactly. So we take it for granted that it will always be there and that that system is robust. But I think what we're seeing now is the system is not robust. The system is actually quite fragile. I mean, I just read an article um, uh, about dairy farmers and like one of the largest co-ops and they're having to dump their milk. And it's like what you're saying because they can't shift these channels that quickly enough. I mean, have you, did you, did you read that story? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's, that's a perfect example of where the, 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 uh, the pathway the, the, and the, the packaging, the packaging and the, the labeling, the licensing, all the things for, for a, a wholesale account, a restaurant account, for example, um, schools, schools are what, they drink 7% 7, 7 of fluid milk, but guess what? It all comes in little itty bitty cartons. Well, nobody buys those for your, for your home. So when schools shut down, 7% of that milk inventory is now not saleable because nobody buys it in little paper one cup cartons. I mean, that, that, that's another perfect example of how um, the, once you, once you head down that path, you can't, you can't just turn around. It's, um, you know, it, it's a different, it's a different path. And so, so we're seeing that kind of shock throughout the system. And when you realize that, um, that, the average city only has three days worth of food in inventory. Three days worth of food. Now that's, that's not much. So when you have a shock like this and people are saying, people suddenly say, Ooh, I need to get two weeks worth of food. The, the system simply can't respond to that again, because it's just in time inventory and you can't back up the chain. It, it takes a while to, to be into it. So we, we have had numerous people actually even here at the farm who have said for five years, you know, I want to go out there someday. I want to go out there sometime. Suddenly they're coming out here and they're finding food that they can't get at the supermarket because we have an inventory. We, we don't run it that close. We're not that fragile. And, and I'm hearing that same thing throughout, throughout the country. And it's um, uh, all, all of the direct farm uh, farmers that I've talked to, every one of them uh, has said this is the, financially, this is the best thing that ever happened to them. And, uh, and, and we love it. You know, when somebody comes in and says, I'm never going back to the supermarket because now I know, I know where the most dependable food supply is. And, uh, and there, I've even talked to farmers that are, look, that are thinking about offering is essentially an Amazon Prime thing for their customers, like, like a, a food insurance policy. Pay me $100 a year and you move to Prime class. So whenever there's a, whenever there's a shock in the system, you get, you get first dibs. And if you're not a subscriber, you, know, you get shoved down to, you know, to, to plan B. But, but if you want to ensure that from now for the rest of your life, you get plan A status, you know, um, uh, <laughs> first class status, okay, pay me $100 a year and you're on my special little cheerleader squad and you get fed no matter what. There are farmers talking about this. Uh, you know, what, a, what an interesting um, additional income thing for, I mean, if, if a farmer could have, uh, you know, 100, 100 customers, that would that would pay a hundred dollars for this a class status that'd be a ten thousand dollar a year income that that would you know it, it, it's good for both it, it, it's helpful for the farmer to know that these people are are loyal they're the real deal and for all of those people they would be able to rest at night knowing no matter what happens this farmer's going to take care of me yeah. that's cool too yeah, that's very innovative. I, I actually, I love that concept and hearing you speak about it because of all the, even the difficulty I've been experiencing trying to procure food. Um, you know, and I do have a, a food supply that I keep on hand all the time, but it's still, it's scary because it's never happened before. So just oh, yeah. hearing you talk about it actually kind of calmed my body down. It gives me a little peace of mind. And it actually makes me think of, um, you know, as a constitutionalist, it's, 
scary to me all of the liberties and the freedoms that we're readily handing over um, due to government mandates and so forth. But one thing that I thought of that I think this situation brings a great opportunity to reclaim a freedom that I don't think most of us realized we gave up. And that is this, you know, this food independence. It's realizing I am dependent on this industrial food supply. It is not robust. It is fragile. Um, and how can I reclaim some of that food freedom for myself so that I can feed myself and I can rest assured at night knowing that tomorrow I can feed my family. So right. I think there's a fantastic opportunity for consumers and it will help farmers as well, like in working in that partnership to come out of this knowing that, yeah, we're losing these freedoms right here. Hopefully we're going to get those back, but that here I can actually um, create new freedoms for my, or claim these new freedoms for myself, you know, for, for security for myself and my family. Um, I mean, how are you seeing that too, that you're yeah. sharing that perspective that we're able to now claim these freedoms that we've lost? Sure, absolutely. I mean, uh, for example, all, all of the chick hatcheries, I don't know if you know this, but every chick hatchery in the country is sold out for like the next two months. You, you can't get chicks. Uh, and we've had a run here at the farm. We, you know, we sell pullets for a little, you know, if you want two or three pullets for a little backyard chicken flock. Uh, we've had a run on those in the last two weeks. We've never seen anything like it. People are coming in here getting, you know, I want three chickens. I want four chickens. Why? So they can have eggs in their backyard. Um, that's part of this, this food security. Another thing is that people, people are coming in uh, purchasing volume, bulk stuff, uh, rather than just I'm, I'm buying for the week, they're buying for the month. So instead of, coming, instead of going out with a little, a little cooler bag, they're going out with two coolers. They, they want to reestablish uh, and I'm sure I haven't seen numbers, but I'm sure the sales of chest freezers is up. Um, I know that that seed companies right now, like Johnny's and Southern Seed Exposure, go to their website. They're actually closed down because they're being inundated with people buying seeds. We're going to see more gardens planted this year than, than we have ever seen, perhaps since World War II in the Victory Garden uh, uh, time. And, and that's a good thing. Um, so so th those are all good things. But I'd like to see, I'd like to touch on one other aspect of this, this freedom thing. Uh, I'm hoping that as, as we progress through this, um, that people are going to realize that at the end of the day, I can't depend on the government to take care of me. Now, whether it's to provide face masks or enough hospital beds or whatever, I, you know, name your thing. And I don't want to get into who's responsible for what. I'm just bringing up that as I see uh, things play out around the world, what, even, even the fact, um, uh, to, to, even, to even feel like we're getting accurate information I mean, there's people who say, well, this, this was a, a, a bio weapon developed by the Chinese. The Chinese say, well, the U.S. developed as a bio weapon and, and somebody let it loose. And then, of course, we've got the bats in the wet markets in Wuhan. And, and who knows anything? And so all of this, all of this kind of what can I know leads people, I think, to, well, what can I know? What can I know is I can work on my own immune system. And what, and, and, and what we have not seen uh, in all the initiatives from the government that I think are, uh, in some ways, they're overkill, but that's another discussion. Um, in, the, in the responses from the government, I haven't heard anybody yet say, hey, let's have a national initiative to build our individual immune systems. So how about we don't drink any Coca-Cola for a week? How about, you know, nobody goes to the McDonald's for a week. How about we try that? How about we don't eat any Roma noodles and, uh, and, <laughs> and Velveeta cheese? And um, you know what I'm saying? Um, why, why can't we have an initiative in which all right, everybody, everybody go to bed before 11 o'clock 
back and get eight hours of sleep? Um, is there somebody that you hate and you're and you are a vengeful about that you just despise? All right, tonight, forgive them. Let it go. Just let it go. Forgive them. Um, um, you know, drink enough water. Let, let's let's have a week where we drink enough water and everybody hydrates enough. You, you, you sleep, you, you drink water, not drink alcohol, but drink water, um, and, and you, you forgive and, uh, and, and um, uh, do some yoga and a little bit of exercise, and then um, you know, maybe go out to a farm and walk barefoot in the pastures, put your hands in some, in some compost to, to stimulate your microbiome, you know, and let's, let's have an initiative on freeing ourselves up from a dependency on 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 a on a on a bad bug uh, people with a robust immune system maybe there are a few who have died but not very many not very many most people who have a robust immune system literally um either show no symptoms at all or they feel a little bit yucky, run down for a day or two, and they're right back at it. it it's, it's no worse than the flu or whatever. And so, so, so you know, a, uh, um, if, if we would attack, if we would attack wellness, or, or, or if we would embrace wellness with the same desperation as we're embracing a war on a bug, whew, we could come out of this a whole lot better culture. Exactly. It, it could be a big game changer. Um, I like what you're saying because it is, it's shifting out of fear, right? Right now it's, a, it's all fear-based. You know, a lot, most of us are terrified and um, yeah. whether or not that's, you know, founded, not for discussion here, but it's definitely fear-based and it would be nice to shift from that fear to, you know what, I, there is something I can do about this. And you bring up an excellent point because the question becomes, who is immunocompromised, right? And um, right. What, we're, what I've learned in my studies is that the majority of Americans are somewhere on the autoimmune continuum. And they may not realize it. Maybe they just have seasonal allergies and they're taking, you know, some kind of prescription medicine, a steroid or whatnot. Well, by definition, you are then immunocompromised. So um, I think what's confounding about this is that a lot of Americans have become immunocompromised. They do not have these robust microbiomes. And so part of this equation, part of this hope is, okay, that is something I can do something about because it is my microbiome. Um, the choices that I make are gonna change my microbiome. I don't need the government to come down and tell me, you need to do X, Y, and Z to improve right. your microbiome. There's right. enough information out there, you know how to do that. And one of the great ways to do that is to try to get out of the grocery store as much as you can and onto the local farms. And part of that is visit the farm if you can, like you said, you're yeah. in that great environment where you're gonna be breathing in those, microbi those microbes and getting them on your skin. Um, and now we're talking about more farms like yours, like more regenerative farms, not the farms that spray all these pesticides and herbicides, right? And, and the plant yeah. GMOs, we're not talking about it, that. It, it, it might not help you to walk down through a Tyson uh, a chicken factory farm, that, that, that probably wouldn't help you. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, pick your farms carefully. You want to go for that, the organic regenerative farms and breathe in uh, those microbes, you know. Yeah, but yeah. also, the, the second part of getting out of that grocery store and onto the farm is that, as you know, most of that food in the grocery store is sterile. It's been sterilized. So it does not have this healthy microbiome on the food itself, which is one way that you build your robust microbiome is by what you're consuming. And if you're consuming sterilized foods, that's gonna um, eventually lead to decreasing the diversity and the robustness of your own microbes in your own system. You know, most people, uh, when you say the word bug, uh, which is a pretty generic, uh, you're a scientist, so you can cringe when I say the word bug, but, <laughs> but, 
you know what I mean, bugs. All right. When you say the word bug, the average person just gets all, you know, uh, uh, concerned. But actually, in the world of bugs, microbes, uh, nematodes, uh, protozoa, all these uh, things, um, actually, the, the lion's share, I mean, like lion's share, like, like 96, 97% are actually good. Very, very few of them are actually um, a pathogenic. And, and so um, there are places for sterility, you know, a, 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 sur a, sur a surgery probably should be sterile. Uh, but, you know, uh, we're actually only 15% human uh, we're 85 percent not human you know the fact that there are microbes within our cells um, dating marrying breeding and dying um, <laughs> with with doing their whole life within a cell wall I mean it, to the layman, it's almost, you, you can't wrap your head around that. And yet that's reality. That's the truth. And so, so if we can, if we can make that function better, if we can make that invisible world function better, you know, uh, you use the word fear, maybe I could use the word faith. And I, I don't, I don't mean necessarily religious faith. I mean, you know, faith is, is some, is in something that you don't see readily. Well, this, invisible world in us on our skin in the air around us by, by faith we say well you know i'm going to embrace that world i'm going to embrace that world and um you know that that is a far more hopeful outlook it, it, it's a it's it's a proactive uh freeing outlook as opposed to what I'm reading in the media where people are committing suicide because they worry themselves. They watch the news every day and, and, and they're literally worrying themselves sick. And, and that's a, that's a, that's a horrible place to put yourself in. And so if we could take all of that worry and anxiety and take that energy we're spending on that and instead um, embrace this 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 wonderful workable um, uh, invisible world that actually wants us to be healthy. Wow, what a different you know what a, what a different outlook that is for us. Yeah, I love that 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 resonates with me deeply because as you know, I've been on both sides of the coin. Right. So when yeah. I was really really sick with the autoimmune condition. Um, uh, and this was at the point at my rock bottom where we were, we were all sure I was going to die. And the functional medicine doctor was like, this is really bad. Um, I lived in that space of fear yeah. it, for almost every facet of my life. I was in constant fear. I didn't want to go outside during flu season. I was afraid to get any kind of sickness. Um, and part of that was because since I was so immunocompromised when I got sick, Maybe my family would have symptoms for three, four days, and I would have it for at least two weeks and just be debilitated. Right. Um, the flu is, I caught the flu one time, my whole family got it, and they all ended up getting over it in a couple of days, and I ended up going to the hospital. Like, I wow. fainted, you know, had to go in and get IVs. It was really, really bad. Um, that, and that was my rock bottom, and I spiraled down here from them, from there. So I understand that fear that some people are going through, especially if they know already that they are immunocompromised, because um, it, it can be life altering uh, when you do catch an infectious organism. Sure. However, now that I'm on the flip side of it, I understand how, how unhealthy it is to sit in that space of fear. And that when you project that energy out, it just attracts more of that fear to you. So I was actually keeping myself sick by sitting in that space of fear. Now that I'm healthy, um, I don't have that fear. Now, I, even after everything I've been, to, been through, um, and you hear stories about people surviving autoimmune conditions and, and they view it as, oh, my body attacked me, my body failed me. I don't view it that way at all. Now I view my wow. body as being 
completely resilient. The fact that it, your body can come back from near death mm -hmm. and be perfectly healthy um, in a short period of time, it's absolutely a story of hope for people that you can recover from practically any, any type of disease. And one way that I recovered from it was by focusing on building my robust microbiome. Um, and I didn't obsess about it. I didn't do it as, um, you know, like, oh, I have to do this today. Like it's on my checklist. I did it as I'm going to love myself today by making a choice for myself that's going to help me to become more resilient. So what I would do is I would think of in my next meal, where do I want that meal to come from? You know, what is it that I actually want to put in my body? Um, and for me, it's not the sterile foods that are found in the grocery store. It's not that dependence on that industrial food system that, as I know, can just fall apart in a moment. It is visiting my local farmers, supporting them, going out to the farm, growing my own, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables as much as I can um, so that I can, in, in, in every meal, um, or as much as I can in every meal, that I'm actually building my robust microbiome. And that gives you such a sense of peace, you know, yes. that you are resilient. Yes. And that even if I, if even now, um, if I went out, if I caught COVID-19, I would not be scared because I know that my body could overcome it because of the choices that I make. And it comes back to what you are saying is taking personal responsibility Right. If I was depending on the government to protect me from COVID-19, I would be terrified at this point. And I would I would just be a sheep following whatever so, they tell me to do. So so what do you say to the person? This is why I love you, Cena. And, and by the you know, by the way, we may maybe need to remind people that you and I are releasing a book together, Beyond Labels, uh, coming out here in, in about June, I think. Uh, that that uh, that is going to address. I mean, this this is the stuff that makes me weep when I you know read your story and and where you've talked about your your literal your 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 emotional and spiritual shift in this. It's 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 profound and very moving and and some of my um, my my most favorite parts. But so so what do you say to people then who who say, well, you, you're not taking this seriously. You're you're taking a, this this you know, a cavalier approach. Uh, who do you think you are? You know, there's this, there's this, there's this pushback. I mean, I'm getting it. I, I, I've, I've been pretty aggressive about, I want to be exposed to it because I want us to get as a culture, I want us to get to that 60% herd immunity point. As soon as we get to that 60% herd immunity point, then, you know, then we're going to, then we're going to see a, a totally different thing. And, um, and I'm not scared of it either. Um, in fact, you know, I've, I've, I said I, I want to be exposed to, to help get to that herd immunity so that we get through it. But what do you say to people then who's, well, you're, uh, you're being irrational or you're, you're being cavalier, you're not being realistic, you know? Yeah, excellent question. Or, or maybe not, not even charitable. You're, you're, you don't even appreciate that somebody's dying from this, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. And I have, as you know, <laughs> I've remained silent <laughs> on the issue because I sense not only from talking to people, listening to multiple news outlets, reading feed on Facebook, there is such an overwhelming sense of fear. Mm -hmm. And as I know from personal experience, when you're in that state of fear, oftentimes it's difficult to hear another perspective right. another opinion that's right that's so right. for me it's not the right time to come out you know and it's beginning to i feel as though it's beginning to become the right time to talk about the loss of liberties uh, most people i don't think are there yet but there is a slow you know simmering of people who are now starting to talk about it i see some feed on facebook for instance mm -hmm. um even in the homeschool community there's people posting articles and they're like, wake up, what's happening here? Like, you know, so um, I think it, there is starting to be somewhat of a little bit of a shift. What I have, when people have come to me, like friends, family members, some subscribers have emailed and they ask me, what's your opinion? What should I be doing? My thought is if you are immunocompromised, then yes, protect yourself. 
And this is what I do to protect myself. And one of the ways is um, with vitamin C. Um, I have a protocol in, in case I do get a viral infection, uh, including a, if it is COVID-19, I have a protocol of supplements that I follow. And so I share that protocol with them, which also gives them peace of mind that I'm going to take responsibility. I'm not going to run over to the hospital and hope that they give me an, an IV vitamin C. Um, but here, there's something I can do for myself, and I'm going to have it on hand for so I'm ready to do it. Yeah. And that just, is just for the record, I've been taking uh, mega doses of vitamin C for 30 years, e every day. I just take, and and again, I, I don't say this this proudly. I say it humbly, but 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 hopefully encouragingly that you know. I, I have not, I mean, around here, the joke is Joel never gets sick. Well, you know, I, I haven't been sick in like 20 years. I mean, just nothing. Okay. That's not arrogant. It's to me, it's, it's a fundamentally hopeful view. Don't, don't denigrate me for saying I haven't been sick in 20 years. I mean, not even a cold. Um, but, but perhaps, Perhaps if you did some things that I did, like eat really well, don't stay up late, sleep, drink a lot of really, really good water, uh, even out of the stock tank with the cows, you know, to feed my microbiome um, and, and mega vitamin C. I take routine supplements. Um, uh, and look, nature's not our enemy. Nature's our friend. And, and, and so if we, if we embrace this, uh, the, the odds are stacked in our favor that if we, if we go with nature's template, there's no guarantee, but we sure change the odds. Yes, for sure. And I think there's, there's the bigger issue too of just the first time, at least in my lifetime, that we've experienced something like this. Right. You know? Right. And mm -hmm. so when something's new and you're not prepared for most people, it just came out of the blue, you know? Right. And right. so I think it's natural to go into this space of fear because the, there's so many unknowns. And like you previously mentioned, we're getting conflicting stories, adding to the confusion, adding to the fuel of the fire of the fear. Right. You know, so we're sitting in that space and we're wondering, well, what am I supposed to be doing? but they're telling us to lock down. So this has to be horrific. Like I seriously don't want to get this, you know? Um, and so I think it is difficult to, to pull yourself out of that and to go back into the mind frame of there's something that I could do about this. But I think that um, just like there's the opportunity to reclaim the freedom of, of your food freedom, this is an opportunity for people to understand the importance of wellness, that it's not just for aesthetics. It's not just, oh, swimsuit season's coming up. I want to look good in that swimsuit, right? I mean, how many years did I do that, right? <laughs> but this is really, um, this is really about taking that personal responsibility right. to build your own wellness so that you can move through life without fear, with this faith that you talked about, that you are going to be okay. And so yeah. I think that's a big takeaway message for people now is how critical the issue of wellness is and to start learning some steps that they can take, so, you know, which uh, we provide steps in our book. So yes. I, I wish that was out right now, but when that comes <laughs> out, there's baby steps right there in the book to help you build a them. robust uh, microbiome. Yeah. Lots of them. And you know, you know, there's a, there's sometimes there's this, uh, whatever fine line between um, between courage and arrogance, mm -hmm. and and um, I don't want anybody to think that you and I are coming across as arrogant. I, but but I think I think there is there's a place for courage in 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 courageously defending there's a protocol. There's a wellness protocol. It's been with us for a long, long time. This is not new. It's not new rocket science. You know, you, you eat food that you can pronounce. You, uh, you know, you, you have a personal relationship with as much of your food as possible. 
uh, whether it's whether it's the provenance, whether it's the preparation. Um, goodness, you know, chances are, uh, if we had a little more sophisticated, you know, calibration equipment, it's very possible that we would have we would find that when you when you actually breathe the aroma of preparing food in your kitchen, it actually affects your hormones and your digestive ability to even be able to digest the food better than if it's just you know, uh, uh, a grazable, munchable, you know, that, that uh, in a sterile package that has no smell. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's beautifully complex. And, um, and so uh, we don't come at this flippantly. We come at this, uh, I, I think, from, a, from just a, a, a grounded, um, a grounded, reasonable, sensible standpoint that that is really the it's the only reasonable way to move forward otherwise you're just stuck yeah yeah and sometimes that's the hardest part it's just figuring out what that first step is to be able to move forward right you know so mm -hmm. um yeah i and i agree um you know i don't think joel and i are not trying to say that we have the answer to everything <laughs> we have all the solutions we're sharing what has worked for us and what we see historically has has worked for civilization. And it's pretty much getting back to the basics, you know? So, um, and I know um, I wanna start wrapping up because I've kept you longer than I said. So I wanted to end with some solutions. Some of this will be recap. So solutions to um, independent, uh, into, Solutions to dependence on the industrial food system, dependence on the government, basically shifting out of that fear into that faith space. So one of the, one of them that we talked about was um, growing your own. So growing your own fruits and vegetables or raising your own chickens, you know, um, the closer to home, the better you can get. The second is um, finding and supporting your local farmers, whether that be through, um, you know, food delivery through the mail system. I mean, like now, people across the country can order polyface online. That's right. That's right. Um, if possible, visit the farmer. Yes. You know, get to know the farmer, build a relationship with them, um, put your hands in the soil, breathe in the microbes. Uh, another one I love, you talk about this too in the book, is um, build a, a larder. Right? Yeah. I think a lot of people don't have that, right? So, and if you want to mention right. or well, just, for a moment. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the larder... Uh, in historically, the larder was like a it was like a glorified pantry uh, where you kept especially um, seasoned meat. You know, that's where your cured ham was and your um, salt pork and and things like that. But but it it, it connoted a a fairly large. You know, it would include the root cellar, the the pantry, the canned goods, the dried goods. But it was it was what you ate for the winter. You know, it was it, it was like six months out there seven months out there it was it was you, you you built this up for the season and then it was out there until the next season and um and so i, I think that that um that, that that packing in this is not hoarding this is not hoarding this is simply your food savings account um and 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 so so garnering to yourself a food savings account is a really wonderful way to to prepare i mean just think about going into the, the shock of this coronavirus pandemic, think about if every person had had three to six months of cash, like Dave Ramsey says, you know, your emergency fund, three to six months of cash on hand, and had had, let's say, three months worth of food in their larder, just as an ongoing, you know, cycle of, of, of preparation, you know, a couple deep freezers of meat, some canned goods, dried goods, uh, things. Um, think, think of what a difference that would have been. And I would even suggest a little bit of domestic culinary art expertise uh, so that you know how to bake some bread and you know how to, uh, you know, put together some dishes. And, um, and just think what a difference it would have made if every household had that on hand. It, 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 it would have made something as draconian as this quarantine thing is, it would have made it much more um, survivable, much, much less disruptive than this sudden panic of, oh no, I need, you know. Um, 
I need something from the grocery store. Yeah, if we all had a larder, it would definitely change the way that the supply chain looks as well. T -t Today, that has to include toilet paper. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I was worried at one point. I was like, we might run out of toilet paper, even though, you know, we have that in our larder, you know, stock. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and my husband said, I'm not worried about that. I got leaves outside. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I think um, what I've read at least uh, is that the, that there are now companies that are uh, seeing their sales of bidets going through the roof. Uh, so so there, there's now a little home retrofit. You can you know, it's a five minute hookup. You get the, get the little kit in the box and, and you set it up. I mean, that's all Europe. Europe is all, every toilet in Europe has a bidet on it. Every Europe in Europe. And, uh, and we just don't use them in the U.S., but, you know, that's a solution too. Yeah. Or worst case, <laughs> if it gets really bad, we have a hoses. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's right. In our yards. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, and then one more solution that I thought I would bring up, and in case you have more too, is I was thinking about this, and I think it's fantastic that we're seeing this shift in people gardening and people going to the farmers and whatnot. Uh, and what I am a, a little bit concerned about is once this pandemic passes, are people going to go back and fall back into that convenience trap of the grocery store? And not to say that you should never go to the grocery store. I mean, Joel and I both go to the grocery store for various sure. items. So that's not what sure. we're talking about. What I'm saying is maybe we will learn from this how good it is to diversify, right? To not put all our eggs yeah. in the one basket of the grocery store to still, you know, go to the grocery store, but keep your relationship with that local farmer and keep buying from them. Maybe keep a, a small garden if you can. Um, you know, because one of my concerns is for the farmers, um, and this is what I wanted to ask you, is now that you're having more demand, how are you gonna, how are you projecting that for your future, for how to prepare for the future? Because what if everyone just goes back to the grocery store? Well, that's, that's, the, that's the huge unanswered question right now. You know, do we, do we put in more, uh, more lang? Do we buy more chicks? Do we, you know, what, what do we do? And, um, and I think right now it's too early to tell, but um, but I I do think I do think that online sales are going to be up for the foreseeable future, for sure. Plenty of people will go back. But what my friends are saying is, we've had so many new people come. If we can just hold on to ten percent of them, it'll be a game changer for all of us. And so that's kind of what we're looking at. We realize that shoot, convenience is such a powerful, uh, uh, you know, opiate uh, that most people are going to go back to the convenience. Um, and but but a certain percentage. This is this is going to be a shakeup. It's going to be a shakeup big enough that a certain percentage will say we're we're gonna we're gonna make a new a new provenance uh, pathway, and that's. Those will be the ones that are that are better ready to write out the next shot. Yeah, like you mentioned, taking a little more personal responsibility and securing right. their own food freedom. So that that would be fantastic. That's my hope for everybody and everyone listening and watching uh, this video is that we do take away these positives. That it's not all bad. You know, I mean, the situation has obviously many bad parts to it right now. But not every part of this is bad. There's opportunities here, opportunities to claim freedoms that we, we didn't know we even lost and opportunities right. to secure um, you know, new pathways like you, you mentioned so that we do have more security, um, not from the government, but from our own individual choices that we're making. That's so, right. I, it, did you want to add any other solutions or? Uh, as you said, choices, it just reminded me that today that I, I saw the statistic that right now, 72,000 Americans die every year from alcohol abuse. Um, well, I know I'll never die from alcohol abuse. Why? Because I choose not to drink alcohol. Not, not that I won't ever have a glass of wine, but uh, you know, I, I just, I don't really like this stuff that much. But anyway, um, the, the point is, 
I know I'm very confident that I will never be part of that statistic. That is a choice. That is a choice. And so um, I think you and I both, our, our book Beyond Labels is all about is all about choosing and empowering people to be confident in their choice. A lot of people aren't confident in their choice. They, they feel like they don't know enough. And so uh, in the book, we try to bring enough information so that they can feel confident to start making these choices on their own, to be empowered to make those choices. And, and, um, and, and making choices is a skill too. You know, you make one choice and, and it's either a good one or a bad one. And you learn from that and it builds your confidence to make the next one, then the next one, the next one. And so it's, it's an incremental uh, confidence affirming uh, system. You don't make your most difficult choices when you're three years old. You, you make your difficult choices, you know, when you're older. And so it's a, it's a culmination of having made a lot of little choices. And so, um, so I, I, think, I think that we can absolutely um, make better choices individually and culturally uh, that, will, that will soften, you know, whatever future shocks come to the system. Yeah, I mean, perfectly said. Um, and one more thing I want to add in here is that when um, Joel and I have gotten a lot of feedback so far with people who have pre-read the book, and one of the common comments that we've received is that there's no judgment in the book that we really meet people where they are at, um, which can be a difficult thing to do when you're so passionate, you know, like in this conversation, we're both very passionate about food freedom, and, you know, self-reliance. Um, but we really do try to meet people where we're at. So, or where, where they are at. So to end this conversation, I just want to say that um, I think I speak for both Joel and I, that we're not trying to judge people you know, we understand the fear and the fear is real um, mm -hmm. with what's happening right now with COVID-19, you know, been there myself, as I said, from my own experiences. So um, we're not judging that it's okay to be in that space of fear. What we're trying to do is provide some solutions so that one step at a time, you can shift out of that fear and into a faith mentality. And so we've provided some of the solutions here. Um, I'll also provide um, in the description of, of this video and um, podcast, I'll provide some links to how you can locate some local farmers and, um, to get you started and some uh, local um, and some, some seed companies of some seeds that I trust um, in case you want to start planting something and just something small, like a little lettuce plant in your kitchen. Right. Each, like Joel said, each of these steps is a solution that is empowering to you because you are taking personal responsibility and you're doing something for yourself to love yourself every day to build your robust microbiome. And that's going to help over time shift you from that fear space into that faith space. That's right. So any well, last comment or. Nope. That's great. Couldn't say it better. Must. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for taking your time to join me. I know you're really busy. I appreciate it. I appreciate your insight. Uh, you know, respect you tremendously as a farmer and a person. And I can't wait to come to the farm. I've been trying to find eggs on your website. And every day I'm clicking refresh, refresh, and they're not there. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're scrambling as hard as we can. But uh, we, we, just, we just can't squeeze those women any harder. They're just... <laughs> They're doing all they can. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, as soon as you get your eggs, we'll be there at the farm. Okay. All right. Thanks, Sina. Thank you, Joel. Thank, Thank you. you all for, for joining us. I hope you all have a fantastic day.